Hello, everyone. We have almost made it to the end of this semester, and this is our very last Zeitgeist video for British Lit. Welcome to the 18th century. By this point in time, Britain is growing super fast. Its population doubles in the 18th century. By 1800, there are approximately 10 million people living in Britain, and London is Europe's largest city. There's a population of about 1 million people living in London alone. Real improvements in hygiene and uh, preventative medicine are helping this happen. We have our first inoculations ever for smallpox happening during this time. So it's becoming a lot safer to live in a large group of people. Um, at this point, we have to think about party politics for sure. Let's take a look at this uh, image of parliament up here in the top corner. We finally get like two factions in parliament that have developed into what we would think of as modern political parties, the way that we know them today. We have the Whigs and the Tories, and that's Whigs, not like the thing you put on your head, um, like fake hair, but Whig, W-H-I-G. Um, so these parties grow out of the divisions that we've already talked about, um, about whether or not James II should succeed his brother. So this goes all the way back to the 1680s. And even earlier than that, it carries over the divisions from the Civil War period. But it's during this time that like, we really get momentum and power in these groups of people that are in Parliament. Um, the Whigs are in favor of parliamentary power. They are often like new money kinds of guys. They get their money from trade. They live in the cities. Um, they're often thought of as like reformers or liberals, and they're often Calvinist or uh, dissenters in the way that they think about their religious beliefs. The Tories, on the other hand, are in favor of royal power. Um, they supported the Stuart claims to the throne rather, though, rather than those of William III and uh, the Georges, the Hanoverians who come after him. They are often more conservative, more old money. Um, they live on country estates and they are in favor of Anglican religious traditions. This is also when the office of prime minister is created. Let's take a look at this guy right here in the middle. This is Robert Walpole. Um, he never officially had the title of prime minister, but he has the office of the first Lord of the treasury and chancellor of the exchequer uh, for about 20 years from 1721 to 1742. He is by far the most powerful man in the Whig government. And he has a level of personal control over the government affairs like that no member of parliament had before or probably even since. So think about the world beyond England at this time. We are getting colonies in America. We know a lot about those at this point. And not only in America, the West Indies, these are useful to Britain for trade and for imports and things like that. Um, we also have criminals who are being forcefully deported to the colonies beginning in 1718. You probably heard about this relative to Australia, for example. Uh, but it is during this time period as well that we have the American Revolution. The people living in the colonies are rejecting the idea that they have to pay taxes when they don't have any voice in Parliament. Um, so hopefully we all are familiar with this um, from our own history classes, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, we also at this time period have we have the Seven Years War um, that happens from 1748 to 1756. This is sometimes thought of as like the first real like world war. Um, because the, there's a war between Britain and France, but it's happening in India, America, and, and the Mediterranean. Um, there's also conflicts between Austria and Prussia. Russia and Spain are drawn in, so like there's a lot of countries involved. And so, is it the First World War? Really, like not exactly in the way we'd think about the the two things that we actually do call for the First and Second World War, but certainly a very large um, multinational conflict. We also at this time have the growth of the East India Company. Um, Britain is finally able to really compete in the international spice and tea trade. Um, previously, that had been largely controlled by the Dutch and the Portuguese. And we see the like foundations of the British Empire at this point, because we also have learned the secret to sailing around the globe. So James Cook is able to sail around the globe because of citrus fruit. Yes, indeed, scurvy is not a problem if you have plenty of citrus on board and your, your sailors are not going to get super sick, so you're able to take much longer voyages. Economics of this time period are also really important. 
Um, we'll come back to this big pile of money here um, in just a moment. Let's look at this image down here in the bottom corner. And we're gonna think about the turnpike system that is coming up in England at this time. Um, this is developed in the middle of the 18th century, starts in the 1720s or so. Um, but it's, when it started before the turnpike system, it would have taken about three days for somebody on horseback to get from London to Manchester or to York. But by 1780, when the turnpike system has been completed, you can do that journey in just a day's ride. So it, it enables people to travel across the country much faster and much more safely. We also at this point have commercialism on the rise. Let's go ahead and look at this big pile of money now. It's such a satisfying pile of money, isn't it? It's lovely. Um, this point, anybody can buy fashionable clothing and look like a gentleman or a gentlewoman if they have the money. Um, we finally are at a point where cash and not land is really the, the, the ruler of um, the economic system. So we finally have what we can think of as like a real true middle-class culture develop. Um, we get the beginnings of a capitalist society. So we also, as a result of that, have a leisure industry that's building up or a leisure industry if you prefer. Um, Here's a little pleasure gardens at Vauxhall. So that's a good example of, of that right there. So we have baths, we have these pleasure gardens, we have coffee houses, we have all of these places that people who have time and just want to enjoy it are able to go. And so as a result, as with this cash economy and more people are able to get wealthier, but this means that the poor people are getting poorer and they are becoming more miserable and the numbers of rich are growing. So right now the rich are all about being, you know, hard on crime. We've heard this before, be tough on crime, right? Crime is punished even more harshly than it ever was. The poor receive almost no assistance from anybody, even women and children who are have no way to earn a living um, if they are caught trying to steal bread or something like that. Like the crime um, punishments are just really terrible at this point in time. Okay, um, we also have at this point the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Let's go over here and look at these guys here. We'll look at this coal mine as well as the thing underneath it there. Um, we have the invention of the modern steam engine in 1769. And we also have coal coming to prominence as a heating fuel. Um, Britain mines and uses more coal than every other place in the world combined. Um, if you've seen those famous photos of like Victorian England covered in smog, you know exactly why. Um, this is the beginning of that, that, uh, that industry. We also have on the rise, not just coal, not just mining, but literacy. Literacy is a good thing. Our first newspaper is published in 1701. And by 1760, there's at least 150 newspapers circulating in Britain. We also at this point have the rise of the novel. We can finally talk about that. We've been hinting at it a little bit um, with Orinoco and some of these other earlier texts. Um, but long prose narratives are showing up in a variety of different genres. They're very popular, especially with women readers. We have the foundation of our first public libraries um, in 1725 in Bath and Edinburgh. And then we also have coffee houses, which I've already hinted at, and literary clubs. I love this illustration of all of these folks sitting around coffee house. Um, this is a popular place where people can read and discuss books and, and have like this social activity, like book clubs are, are a thing um, in the 18th century. This is a thing that is not just for men, but also for women, because there are a lot of women who have disposable time and disposable income, and they're looking for um, a way to, to spend their time, their leisure time. With this expanding literacy, though, also comes concern for the purity of the language and how it is used. So let's go up here and look at Mr. Johnson. There we go. We have our very first dictionaries appearing. Um, the very first one is published in 1721, um, but this one, Samuel Johnson's Dictionary in 1755, is the model that every other dictionary afterwards followed. Johnson is a believer that a dictionary should record how a word is used rather than how it should be used. Um, he's what we call a descriptivist uh, rather than a prescriptivist. And this is a pretty important distinction. It's something that all models of dictionaries follow, but it's one of those misconceptions that people who are linguists or who care about the language are always out there trying to correct your grammar and things like that. Um, Johnson, like me, is somebody who believes that we are, we should be more interested in, in thinking about how people use the language rather than like giving them lots of stern lectures on how they should. But this is also a time period when we really do see 
the beginnings of standardized spelling, regardless of where you live in England um, or in America, we're starting to see everybody spell the same words the same way rather than just however it sounds good, however it works. And this is because of things like rising literacy and dictionaries that allow people to really think about, well, how am I being clear in the way that I'm communicating this? So we should have some kind of standardization of the way that we all use our words. Final thing I would like to talk about um, for this video, for this very final Zeitgeist video, is this period that likes to be called the Enlightenment. And yes, I anthropomorphize the period. They gave themselves this name, the Enlightenment. Um, this is a movement by intellectuals and, philo and philosophers who believe really that they are more enlightened than the rest of the world. Um, and they, they want to share their knowledge, but they, they still are, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the Enlightenment. Um, they, they believe that human reason can be uh, a, a great way to combat ignorance and superstition and tyranny, and they want to believe in building a better world, all these things, but they still think that they're more enlightened than everyone else, so I still have kind of a problem with it. Um, they are interested in building a world that is not just dominated by big institutions like um, the Catholic Church, for example, or a hereditary aristocracy, right? They, they want to believe in a world that is governed by reason and merit and learning. And they also want to see history as something that is progressing, right? As in a, that we are inevitably moving towards something better um, than what existed in the past. And although that is of course an admirable belief, we always do want to believe that things are getting better. We also have to be careful about the ways that we judge what came before us. And herein lies my problem and a lot of people's problems with the enlightenment. Um, if nothing else, I hope that this class and these videos have helped you prevent that kind of fallacy, which is that if you believe that the world is going to get better, that it believes that what's behind you is inevitably ignorant and barbarous, right? Um, I think it's possible to believe both in progress as well as in uh, wisdom that comes before us. And so with that, I will thank you for your time, for your attention, for all the great conversations that we've had in this class throughout the semester. And I will sign off on this very last Zeitgeist video. Thanks so much. And I will see you in class.